am. I'm super excited to be back and love the way that I got there, got here. Actually, Danielle, who I worked with at the Umbrella Community Arts Center, which is in Concord, Massachusetts, recommended me to Allie, who I connected with when I lived in Medford five years ago. Um, oh, so, yeah. yes. Yeah, I knew her before grad school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I keep forgetting. Yeah, and Allie actually recommended somebody named Ben Warren, who has become a long-term member of Miranda's Heart and met his current fiance at my organization, because Allie told him to come talk to me. So, <laughs> just goes to show that it's a small world. <laughs> um, and this is, you know, it's, it's important work and it's fun work, but it's also work that keeps you going and keeps you alive. So. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my organization, which is named Miranda's Hearth, tell you some of my story, how I've gotten to where I am, um, and then a little bit about what's happening right now. So Miranda's Hearth is a nonprofit arts organization. We build community through creativity, specifically that's approachable, affordable, and accessible. And a lot of that came from my education at Leslie with Allie, learning that arts are often inaccessible based either on excessive talent or excessive money. And so we wanted to create a space where everyone was encouraged to reconnect with what I consider his innate human creativity. And I differ a little bit from some of my Leslie colleagues by the fact that I do not call everyone an artist. I like to emphasize the fact that to be an artist is a profession, it's a mantle that anyone can take on if they'd like to, but it takes skill and training. But creativity is innate. And that's in every single person. And what I've learned through my years doing community arts programming is if you talk with somebody who's never picked up a pencil before and they walk through your door and you say, oh, you're an artist, it's wonderful, they don't believe you and they walk back out. And if you have that and you say that to somebody who's been a professional artist for a long time, they feel a lack of value for their work. So that's something that I really emphasize. I love helping people reconnect with that creativity and it's a big part of what we do at Miranda's Heart. And so the biggest thing once I got past that was figuring out how do you make places where people can reconnect with their creativity um, in a sustainable long-term way because there are so many, I've been really impressed by Caché and the longevity that you guys have upheld here and the history that you're building. Um, but so many arts organizations come and go really quickly because it's hard, it's hard to maintain financially, energetically, um, that vision, it can be lonely. And so I think I became really passionate about creating operationally sustainable arts organizations that both serve the people outside but also sustain the people who are doing the work. And I think that creative infrastructure is something that is often overlooked in this field. And so it's something that I've started to uh, talk more and more about. So Miranda's Heart specifically was founded in July of 2013. And actually, our first ever Miranda's Heart event was in Medford, mm -hmm. in my apartment on a second floor walk up um, with no air conditioning in July. Um, the Milanos were melting, the wine was sweating. Um, we had four people playing music in an Department and that's how it all began. And I think those humble beginnings are actually really important to the story and to the work because now we've served 25,000 people. We've had hundreds and hundreds of events throughout the past five years. We've done everything from four person jam sessions to 9,000 people showing up at a festival. Um, and I really like that range and reminding myself as an entrepreneur but also the people who come to the community that it's important to experience both the small and the large and that every single impact is an important impact. Um, so that 25,000 people is something that I'm very proud of, but I also try and remember every single person who has come throughout those years. This year alone, we're doing 120 events and we are straddling Cambridge and Somerville and then Beverly, Massachusetts, which we'll get into a little bit more later. All of our events so far have started in Cambridge and Somerville, that's where I was going to school, and I have had this <coughs> vision since eight years ago to start something called a community art hotel. And what I want to do is to combine a functioning for-profit hospitality industry with a non-profit community arts industry to create a self-sustainable social enterprise where the artists create a desirable destination and rooms filled with artwork and then the people who come and stay provide financial security for the artists who are in the building. And I'm really passionate about breaking down this dichotomy between for-profit and non-profit. Now you may notice that I said I've been working on this for eight years, it's still a vision, because what happens is every couple of years I say this is where I am, and this is where I would like to be, and what's in between. And so when we started with Miranda's Hearth, I was 17 years old, and I had no idea what I was doing, but what I did know is that I wanted to bring people together to make things. So we started with the people first, because I have actually found, and Allie and I were chatting about this just the other day, 
Um, I was the intern at Spring Step the year that it closed in Medford, uh, which was a transformational, not very pleasant, but very important experience. And one of the things I learned from that is that build it and they will come doesn't really work. And instead you need to bring the people together first. So for five and a half years I've been hosting these events and asking people, what do you need? What are you interested in? What are you looking for? How does this work? And we've had just as many failures as successes. And because of that, now we're going into our next stage thinking about, okay, we know that people will show up for this, but not for this. And for example, one of the core tenets of our community is that consistency builds community. And I started hosting events every single month because I thought once a month was enough. And I experienced, experimented with that for four or five years. And I found out that if you miss one monthly event, that's a big gap between two different events. And that actually it's weekly events that build that sense of constant community and consistent community. So right now we host weekly community nights every single Monday in Somerville and every single Wednesday in Beverly. And the goal is that people know, you don't need to check your calendar, we will be there on Memorial Day because it's a Monday. We will be there on Wednesday because it's a Wednesday. And that kind of consistency is what helps people belong. It's the kind of consistency I also found at the Umbrella Community Arts Center, where I worked for four and a half years, and when I show up there even now, I can tell you who will be at the lunch table at exactly 12.30, <laughs> because I had lunch with them for four and a half years. And that consistency is how things actually grow. And it's a thing that's really disintegrating as we become a more urban society, a more industrial society, that consistent expectation of places to show up and people to be there for you is starting to go away. And I, I'm really passionate about the arts being a solution to that really troubling problem. So I wanna go back a little bit into my history and I'm really interested about what Laurel's been talking about with the Medford Arts Collaboration and the building collaborative and the building you're looking at here because I've become very passionate about repurposing old buildings to create this sustainable infrastructure where you can do consistent community programming and create for lack of a better word, a park where people feel like they can belong. So I've referenced some of these things, as has Allie. Um, I got a bachelor's in painting and pottery from Mary Baldwin College, um, and that was the first step. I knew I wanted to have a career in the arts that wasn't financially dependent on my artwork. So as a young person, I started thinking, how do I do that? And I looked at architecture and art therapy and art education. I ended up in community art because of a transformational trip to El Salvador with a community artist named Claudia Bernardi. I will happily tell you that whole story in detail at any moment, but probably not right now. Um, and when I came back, I knew I wanted to start a community art center. That was 11 years ago. So I've been walking down this path since then, trying to figure out what comes next. How do we make this actually sustain? How do we make this grow in a way that will last past myself especially? because a lot of nonprofits suffer from something called the founder syndrome. So you have one charismatic jack of all trades who can do everything, so they try and do a little bit of everything instead of finding the right people who can do it better. And so what we're trying to do with this organization is find the people who do the work well. And it's a humbling experience to always have to remind yourself that you are not the right person for half of the things that you really, really want to be doing. And so that's something that I learned in part from Spring Step, in part from the Umbrella, and pretty much every arts organization I've been in, that it's, it takes a strong level of self-reflection to know what you should and should not be doing in your arts organization. I think the best arts organizations have people at the helm who do that self-reflection, and then who find the people who can fill those roles. So after my bachelor's, I came up to Leslie. I studied uh, community art, because I knew I wanted to start a community arts center. I studied under Kit Jenkins, who's the founder and executive director of Raw Artworks up in Lynn, which if you don't know about them, definitely look them up. They are the epitome of what an art center should be and should look like. Um, and she's the very first one who sat me down and said, just so you know, if you're gonna do this work, you're gonna spend 75% of your time fundraising to do the actual work 25% of the time. And thus came this obsession with operations and sustainability and human resource management in such ways that we can treat people well so that they stay so that we don't have high turnover. All of these business things that the nonprofit world thinks it doesn't have to think about, and especially the arts nonprofit world <laughs> likes not to think about. So I left that degree and I realized that I still had no business experience. I had a degree in education, I had a degree in art, 
And so after that, I joined the Umbrella Community Arts uh, Center as their office manager. And over the course of four and a half years, I wrote three job expansions. Because like Ali said, I sometimes have too much energy for what's good for me. Um, <laughs> and ended up as their director of operations and visual arts. And I saw them through the beginning of a 20 now, $20 million capital campaign project where they moved 60 artists out of spaces that they've been in for 36 years. So I want to focus in on the umbrella a little bit because it is one of the precedents that I use for my organization and I think could be helpful. So some of the conversations that are happening here in Medford as well. So the umbrella was founded in 1983 by a group of artists who banded together around an empty building. And this is a story that comes up over and over and over again throughout Massachusetts and really throughout the country. Um, it was, was 40,000 square feet and high school built in 1929. And by the time the artists found it, it had been empty for about 10 years. So there were literally stalactites yeah. growing <laughs> from the ceiling. Yeah. And uh, I, a lot of the artists, what's really fascinating to me and I think shows how dependable artists are in a way that the business world does not expect us to be, is that a lot of the artists in that building have been there since 1983. So of the 55 artists who are still in that building, at least five to 10 of them have been there since the first 10 years when it was founded. And what that shows is twofold. One is that when you find a community, you stick with it. It's so rare to find those spaces to be yourself, to know how to make things. The second, on the more operational side, is that affordable artist studio space is incredibly rare. And when people get it, they do not let go. And this is an important precedent for my business because we are trying to currently build the largest artist studio space on the North Shore in Beverly, Massachusetts. And one of the most important numbers from that is that in the time that I worked at the Umbrella, one studio became available about every year and a half. We had an interested artist list of nearly 100 people. So if you do that math, there is a huge demand for space, both in terms of the affordability of it and in terms of the community that's surrounded by it. Importantly, and I know I'm know there's you guys already have some support from the town in terms of the project here, um, but the building for the Umbrella Community Arts Center is leased for a dollar a year from the town of Concord, and so it's one of many examples where a municipality and a nonprofit arts organization partner to offer a public benefit that helps everybody in the town. So the second one, which was actually founded by one of the former executive directors of Emerson Umbrella, now the Umbrella, is Jerome Neeson. And so he went from the Umbrella to Art Space Maynard. And I think something that's interesting in this transformation is that the Umbrella Community Arts Center has five different programs. It has performing arts, studio arts, gallery arts, arts education, and arts and environment. Um, in Art Space Maynard, Jerome really narrowed down. And so this building is 100% artist studio space. And there are a couple different reasons for that. One is the clarity of mission, but the other is that artist studio space is a very solid business model. You can take it to a bank, you can take it to somebody who works in government, you provide raw space, you figure out exactly what it costs to run that space, you figure out what you need to charge for the amount of space available, and then you cover the costs. It's a pretty simple business plan. Once you start adding in programming, once you start adding in performance, things get a lot more complicated, which is not to say don't do those things, but it is to say from the point of view of visioning out, it's really easy to get excited. It's really easy to say we could do this and we could do this and we could add this, but that complicates the story and it complicates the business plan at the same time. So I picked up personally from these stories to keep it simple, keep it as simple as possible and it's the most likely to work and work well. And then once you have those people there, once you have a ton of artists in the same building, that's when the creativity erupts out of everywhere. So as the people who are leading these organizations, I think it's really important to figure out what you're trying to do and make sure you're keeping your own giant ideas in check so that you can provide this sustainable platform for the people you're trying to serve and their ideas to come out. And it's hard because it's more interesting to come up with lots and lots and lots of fun ideas and it's less fun to do that daily slodge of operational work, which I know a lot of people in this room, and Louise's very impressive budget chart, uh, can show us that you guys have been doing that well. If we did that, it would be, like I said, the largest art center on the North Shore. It's 144,000 square feet. Um, I don't know Medford well enough to compare that to a building in Medford, but I usually try to. 
Um, it is a pentagon that's three stories tall with a gym, an auditorium, 75 classrooms. It's on six acres of land, um, and it's beautiful. It's a beautifully architecturally built building. Um, it has capacity, we estimate, for 150 to 200 artists to spend, um, depending on their needs and the size of their studio space. And we're currently looking at charging $12 per square foot, which means we would have $900,000 income annually. The expected um, expenses for the building, which I think, oh no, that's jumping ahead. Um, so we will go there. The next, the reason we chose Beverly, we actually did a location feasibility study because based on my time at Spring Step, I really wanted to make sure I found a community that needed me as much as I needed them. And I learned that doing this long-term work and growing up from the bottom, making sure I knew what, why I'm doing what I'm doing, making sure I'm serving in a way that is relevant to people, and then making sure I'm finding the right people to serve. Those were all key questions that led us to Beverly. So we did a location feasibility study that was looking around um, within an hour of Boston for a post-industrial or a post-agricultural town that had a strong sense of the arts, had a lot of artists there, but was still missing some key infrastructural support. So it was a place where we could make a serious impact but not be alone. Mm -hmm. And it was a really sweet spot to find. And Beverly started rising higher and higher to the top of the list. These are all arts, or arts organizations that are already in Beverly, uh, and they're bringing hundreds of thousands of people downtown already. But what I have found is that Beverly's wheel of arts is very, very strong, but there's a missing hub in the center of it. And that creative infrastructure, which brings people together, which brings all of these disparate parts of the organization into one space to make things and to meet each other, is what we're trying to offer with BevArt by becoming the hub of the wheel. And it sounds like that's very similar to what's happening in Medford right now. I know there are a lot of really wonderful arts organizations, and I've been amazed to hear from Allie about how there are hundreds of events now on the on the calendar but as more and more beautiful things start to happen in the community it's easy actually for it to become more and more siloed right when there's one big event that everybody gets involved in there's one big event that everybody shows up to but when there are hundreds of different events it can become more complicated to figure out what your story is why are people coming here what's this art story of Medford and that's exactly what we're trying to figure out in Beverly, and we don't want to step on anybody that's already there. I, I am 100% in agreement of making the pie bigger rather than fighting for different pieces of the same pie. And I think that's what creative infrastructure, that's what these old beautiful buildings that are empty can do. Because not only is consistency building community in place of how often the events are there, but also in terms of space. So I have found as somebody running an arts organization without a building for five and a half years, that it can be really difficult to constantly be asking your community to come to different locations. But when people feel a sense of ownership over a building, that's when they can really start to commit at a new stage and a new level. So I have some nitpicky numbers, which I'm happy to talk with anyone about. The basic overview of this slide is that arts organizations are a sustainable business enterprise. They cost less to run than they do when you take in money. Um, one thing that I will emphasize, especially with these old schools and old buildings, is that although it sounds like a generous net to have $300,000 every year, buildings like this need significant work. And I think when arts organizations go into these old buildings, even if you get them for a dollar, it can sound like a huge gift, but it can really be a lot more uh, work than you're anticipating. And so I'm sure the people in this room have looked really deeply into all of the buildings in this area and know very well um, that they're bears to run, but thankfully we're all very creative people. Uh, and business is just another art form that needs to be brainstormed and made more, uh, more beautiful. So these are a little more specifics about Beverly. I'm happy to go into details with anyone, but I think I wanna get to the Q&A session to make sure that I'm answering things that are specifically relevant to people in this room. I will say that in Beverly, um, I was touring this middle school again this morning, and I realized that I had first entered it about two years ago. And I think that timeline, to me it feels really long, but it's still short in terms of community development. And you know that's why I'm really touched to see that Circle the Square, which I told stories at and sold books at five years ago, is still going. Because that long-term investment, that's how you really build the foundation to keep so when we knew we wanted this building in Beverly, 
we started first with events. We brought up the tiny house that we built uh, and put it as a public art display at Montserrat College of Art in order to engage people. I will say, if you ever want to run for public office, build a tiny house and put it downtown and you'll meet everybody. <laughs> I met 1,300 people that month. And I still, I was at a coffee shop yesterday and this woman looked at me and she said, oh, you look really familiar, have we met? And I said, I, I honestly have no idea. And she said, I've been in your house. <laughs> so, you know, you can always build a tiny house and put it out front and then everybody will know that you're there. <laughs> We're doing two festivals coming up. The, uh, one is actually in a week and a half, and if anybody wants to experience the arts world in Beverly, I hope you'll come join us. Uh, we're doing Nourish Beverly on June 1st, and it celebrates local food, history, art, and music. And then um, with our tiny house, we host the annual Massachusetts Big Tiny House Festival. Uh, that was the one where last year we got 9,000 people to turn out to Marshfield. This year we're hoping to have just as many come up to Beverly, so I hope you'll come and experience some creative lifestyle um, options for yourselves. Um, so I want to open up the floor and make sure that um, I'm talking about things that are relevant to people in this room. See what I know Louise had some questions. I did. Um, I did watch your full video oh, in front you. of the city council and you were fabulous. Yeah. Nobody could argue the point of view that you have <laughs> all the answers. Um, you sort of showed a fine line chart during your um, your question and answer period and somebody did ask you about, um, well they seem to have knowledge about um, the everyday workings of that building and how much it costs to run the building itself. Did you have city engineers that were like willing to work with you to give you this information? Um, so how if, did you collect that? Sure. Um, I have talked to anyone and everyone who will talk with me. <laughs> um, I used to think that that was how I was approaching the world first off and now I realize it's just a daily philosophy. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean if you're looking at a city building, it's all public record. Mm -hmm. So I called the woman who runs the public financing for the school district and sat down with her for an hour and a half and she looked up and she said, for the past 10 years, here's exactly what it costs to have gas delivered to that building. And those are the kinds of numbers that are really important to get. Yeah, um, because saying, you know, it's probably going to cost around $600,000 annually and then finding out that it costs $750,000 annually is the kind of mistake that makes our um, organizations flop. And so the, the first work in any building is to figure out exactly what it costs to run it at the moment and then figure out what you want to put into it in terms of capital investment because in the very long term picture, it costs less money to do a major renovation right away. But we're arts organizations. We don't have 10 or 20 million dollars at our beck and call. And so doing that detailed analysis and asking them, because if especially if it's a publicly owned building, it should be public record. If it's not, if it was tied to a nonprofit of some sort, they might still be willing to share. I've been amazed by the number of people who respond just because you walk through their door and you smile. Yeah, that's right. I also saw in the presentation a chart where you have said that if you wanted to rehab the whole building, your you know, dream of the cloud in the clouds, that it would probably be two to five million dollars somewhere. You have no idea. But to get it ready mm -hmm. for you know, occupancy right away, be half a million dollars. How did you do that? How did you come up with those numbers or sure. So I've been working with a wonderful construction company called Z E Floyd, who I actually met at the umbrella. And um, they've walked through the building with me many times. And that's, those are um, some professional contacts that you can use because in the construction industry, they're used to giving bids ahead of a project getting done. Right. So they walked through the building with me several times and I got a bunch of different numbers. Um, the building had 86 code compliant issues, which I know because this city paid for a feasibility study of the building when they are trying to figure out whether to turn it into a school, keep it as a school, or give it off. Um, so they did an in-depth feasibility study, which I could then give to a construction company and say, what would it take? And so we're looking at seven to nine million dollars of code compliance alone. If you're trying to build it out to a big, white, pretty, empty box, you're looking at at least 25 million dollars. If you're trying to build it into housing or a hotel, you're looking at easily 45 to 50 million dollars. So what's exciting about arts organizations, it's funny, from the city councilor's point of view, this building is old and terrible, but having worked with artists who went into a building filled of stalactites, um, to me it looks beautiful. <laughs> and so I think it's all about perspective. Artists really like raw space. Artists right. like space where it's okay to get paint on the floor, where it's okay to build a set and tear something down and accidentally dent a wall. Um, so 
Our goal is actually to get in with no renovations. And so the $500,000 is purely for cleaning out the building, which currently looks like the end of Ferris Bueller's Day Off. <laughs> I mean, yeah. literally, just like papers on the floor. It's impressive. Um, so cleaning out the building, any major maintenance, we put in a big line item for that. Um, my time, and then the marketing to get people into the building right away. And our goal is that once you get, the, the worst thing for a building is for it to be empty. It continues to go derelict. Somebody doesn't notice that a window broke and a rat got in. Somebody doesn't notice that a pipe broke and it's leaking all over the ceiling. The worst thing for a building is to be empty. Um, one of my favorite studies talks about the broken window theory. It's an urban planning term. And so the concept is that if there is a broken window, crime goes up. And the reason for that is because you can tell that no one's paying attention. Right, if there's a broken window and it's immediately fixed, you know that people are invested in the area. And so for me, the flip side of that is the painted window theory. I'm going to put a little copyright on that. And if I ever go get a PhD, it'll be on painted window theory. But, um, but if neglect means that crime goes up, then attention through arts means that it goes down. It means community involvement increases because people can tell that people care. And the best way to make people care is if they can tell other people care. And it just continues to grow. Right? So when you show those little pieces, our goal is to get in the building and fill it with artists, and then people will walk through and see the possibility, see, feel the throb of possibility in that building. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, and thanks for watching the, the oh, city council sorry. video. <laughs> yeah? Miranda, when you're um, talking to potential funders, mm -hmm. what are, say, the top three things that they most respond to in terms of this is why we should go for this project? Mm. So I think the most important thing I've learned is that every funder responds to something different, uh, which is kind of a cop out to that question. Mm -hmm. um, because, and what I've found is that what we're trying to do is build as many hooks as possible. And so sometimes I'll be talking to someone and I'll realize within two seconds they don't care about the arts and in two more seconds they don't care about historic preservation, but they're really interested in environmentalism. And so then you shift the conversation and you say, oh, did you know we could put solar panels on this roof? Did you know that it is actually the most environmentally conscious decision to historically preserve a building, rather than gutting it and filling a landfill and filling it with lots of new materials? Um, so that would be my first answer to that question. The second answer um, is something that I, I, I really need to write an article about this because I've referenced it probably every day for the past three weeks. Um, there's something called the ripple effect report, which was written by Togo's research group in the Midwest, I think it was about 10 years ago. And they studied arts advocacy, and they studied the language specifically about arts advocacy, and the fact that artists are one of the worst groups at advocating for themselves. You would think that as people who are trained in self-expression and movement, and we would know how to tell stories well, but we are some of the worst organizations at telling stories in a convincing way. Um, and so what this uh, report said is that the best language for talking about the arts is talking about the ripple effect. Too often people focus in on specific goals. So if you try and talk about arts in the framework of economic development, you can make a compelling case. Arts do strengthen the local economy. They will never strengthen it as much as biotech. And so if somebody is just looking at that bottom line, they're gonna say, oh, that's nice, you can give me $10 billion. This person can give me $200 billion and you'll lose. The other side of it is the social justice side. That's a common arts argument, saying we help people, we make lives better. Arts organizations almost always lose to, lose to food pantries, homeless organizations, organizations doing that stopgap measure in, in order to, to make lives better. And so if you take any one of those elements on their own, they always have somebody else who would deserve the money better. And so this group found, and it's exactly what I use in every conversation I have, that the best way to talk about the arts is they create a ripple effect that touches every single corner of the community. It touches economic development, education, social justice, community engagement, tourism. It is the only thing where you can put your money into one project and impact every single layer of the community in one go. And then you can say, and here's the economic development part of that, and here's the social justice part of that, and here's the educational part of that. And when they say, oh, well, biotech is more, is more economic, you can compare that it's not very social justice oriented and you do both because you are a ripple effect that touches everywhere. So 
So I highly recommend looking up that report. I quote it verbatim. I just want to say the Globe today uh, commented on arts and culture brought in more than the Bruins, the Red Sox, um, uh, the Patriots, and the Celtics combined. That's wonderful. Yeah, and I'm not, you know, please don't uh, misunderstand. I'm not saying don't use those arguments. The issue is that on their own, they don't work. And we've seen it over and over and over again. And we're really convinced by it. So when we use it and we say something like that, and we're like, they made more than the Bruins, <laughs> it's still not enough on its own. So take that, that very important piece of information, and then say, also, arts means that raw artworks in Lynn um, has a 90% or more college acceptance rate when the city of Lynn, on average, has a 40% college acceptance rate. So economic development, education, social justice, all together, that's the convincing argument. I just want to do a time check. I want to. Okay, so those two more questions. Well, I was just wondering, uh, you had a couple of examples up here of art centers, and I noticed that the uh, city, the community that in which they were uh, located, uh, was uh, leasing them for a dollar a year. Correct. Uh, in your experience, what is it that would motivate or have a city or a town agree to do that? So I think in both of those um, examples, they had been empty for a long time, and they had been passed up, and the city did not know what to do with them. Um, and so the artist came in and said, give us a try. Um, what's different in our case in Beverly is that there are some other options coming in, and so we're working hard on that language about creating a partnership between the city and the arts organization. And it's one of the best partnerships a city can do. In an old school, they haven't made tax revenue off of this building for 100 years. Um, they don't want to administrate it. They've made that very, very clear. So they can't fill it with public programming. But they can be a significant partner with no time and with no money and make a transformational effect on the creative economy. And those are things that are very important in the political world, to know that your office, your support, meant that this could happen. So that is also one of the frameworks that you can use. The same answer. It's the same answer to the fundraiser, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's the ripple effect, the quality of life stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And in terms of city government, I mean, everybody, everybody who works in city government is overtapped. And when you can say, here's this beautiful answer to a problem that you have, and you don't actually have to do anything except for hand this over, one of the best things you can do is walk in. And I think this is another thing artists shoot themselves in the foot with. We come in with lots and lots of ideas and no solutions. And people with funding, people in government, they want solutions. They want that one pager, and you can keep all your other ideas to yourself. Whereas as an artist, like I want you to come sit down and tell me all the 20 ideas you had for that building, and yeah, you can tell me the best one as well. And that's one of the things I've had to learn, because I want to share. Uh, you may have noticed that in my city council presentation, I did not mention the Community Art Hotel. Mm -hmm. Because too often, Arts have a really good plan and a lot of big ideas, and people in power say no to the big ideas because there isn't any plan for them, and they ignore the part that has a solid plan. Mm -hmm. And that's about narrowing the focus, which artists are notoriously bad at. So narrow focus, that's a keep it simple, keep it as straightforward as possible, and then once you have a solid entrance, then you can go do all the other things. I think there was one, yeah. Could you say a little bit more about your um, hub and spoke sort of wheel model and the uh, sort of stakeholder dynamics and lessons learned there? I mean, I think with Arts Collaborative, that's sort of the opportunity we're exploring now. You know, one version has a lot of different organizations kind of housed together and, and a sort of uh, a nonprofit sort of overlay. Um, and I'm just curious, um, you know, what, what you've experienced so far in those dynamics between the, the Favart and the other stakeholders? Sure, so I think I am a storyteller and I think storytelling is very important. And I think there's a very, you have to be very careful about making sure that you're doing something in such a way where people don't feel overridden or overrun. And so one of, this is a story we developed very specifically to Beverly. And so it may serve as an inspiration, but I would argue without really knowing what's going on here, um, wouldn't be a directly replicable mold. But what we realized is that Beverly has a ton of art tourism. The Cabot Theater, which is similar to the theater here, was recently renovated and is bringing 90,000 people a year. 
The North Shore Music Theater is bringing hundreds of thousands of people a year to Broadway quality plays. Montserrat College of Art is right there. The Larkin Theater is right there. Um, but what happened to me, which really put this in perspective, is that I wanted to see the Indigo Girls, who are actually playing in Medford. <laughs> I totally missed that deadline and ended up driving to Connecticut. So I saw them in Connecticut, got a hotel room, paid for dinner. I went to the Warner Theater. I saw the Indigo Girls. Cannot tell you the name of the town that I was in. I know nothing else about it. And so what we're trying, what we've discovered in Beverly is that a lot of people are coming there already, but they don't know that hundreds of artists have uh, live in Beverly. So a lot of these arts organizations, they have very specific missions and a lot of them are about bringing outside artists in to provide pe for the people there. And so what we're trying to do is tell the story of the next step. So saying this is very important work, which it is. It's very important work to bring people there. You're fulfilling your missions. None of those arts organizations have the mission of supporting the professional artists who live and work in Beverly. And so that's when we looked around that's what we found was the missing piece, and it was the piece that we wanted to provide. And so now, for example, if you go to Lowell, Massachusetts, you go to the Lowell Folk Festival, you walk around the streets, you're going because of the music, you might see a sign for Western Ave Studios and notice that there are 300 artists in a mill building and it's open once a month. Then it sounds like an art city. It's not just a music festival in a city. It is an art city. And so that's what we're trying to do by providing the hub to the wheel and recognizing the role that everyone else plays. Because I think too often we get competitive and instead we can say, okay, let's look at this broader picture and see where we specifically can fit in. I plan to steal that graphic. Okay. <laughs> Do it. We can have all the arts wheels and then together we'll have like this whole carriage and it'll be great. <laughs>